Hey everyone, it's Glenn Greenwald back with a new episode of System Update here in our home on Rumble. And I'm excited to devote this episode to a really interesting controversy, the one involving the world's top tennis player, Novak Djokovic, and his attempt to remain in the country of Australia, where he hopes to play the Grand Slam tournament, the Australian Open, despite his being unvaccinated. It's a really interesting controversy itself, but it's also a really vivid window into the broader debates over vaccine mandates and individual freedom that continue to percolate in this pandemic. And to help sort through all of these controversies, I'm joined by what I think is the perfect guest to help discuss this. He himself is a professional tennis player, the American player Tennis Sandgren, who just completed his fifth year Inside the top 100, he also is a two-time quarterfinalist at the Australian Open, the tournament that Novak Djokovic is fighting in every way he can to be able to play in. Tennis, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Glenn, thank you for having me. Let's uh, let's wade through this murky, murky water. Yeah, let's do that. So obviously the Djokovic situation has received a lot of media attention, and I want to talk explicitly about it with you. But before we do, I want to talk about your own situation involving a lot of these same issues that he is facing. Um, for those who aren't very familiar with your career with men's professional tennis, generally Australia and the tournaments in Australia have been a really important part of the success that you've enjoyed in your career. As I said, you've made the quarterfinals twice. You almost beat Roger Federer to make the semifinals in a match we don't talk about. You won your first professional tournament ever in one of the tournaments in Australia prior to the Australian Open. It's been really important to your career, not just financially, but in terms of your ability to keep a good ranking that lets you enter other tournaments. And yet, about, as these, these tournaments are about to go on in Australia, despite your being physically healthy, you are not in Australia. You instead are in your home in Tennessee, having chosen not to make the trip to Australia. Why did you make that decision? Well, they... It's interesting because they were threatening or, or flirting with the idea of, of putting this uh, vaccine mandate in place leading up to the tournament. It was, I think, maybe the end of November, and we still didn't know whether or not if you were unvaccinated, you'd be able to get into the country. If they do the two-week quarantine like they did last year, and then you'd be able to play, or if, you'd be able, if you had to pay for the two-week quarantine yourself, if you're unvaccinated, then be able to play. And then I think it was maybe the... The first week of December, they finally announced officially that if you were unvaccinated, you weren't going to be allowed to go play the tournament, go be allowed to get into the country of Australia. And so uh, I'm still not vaccinated. I wasn't vaccinated at that point. Uh, I had already pretty much made the decision that, look, if somebody's going to force me to do this, then I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it for health reasons, and I'm going to do it for health reasons only. I'm not going to do it for a job. I'm not going to do it to go to the movies. I'm not going to do it because I'm being pressured by the state in some form or fashion, and certainly not the Australian government, because, I mean, you turn on the news and you just look at how they're handling things and the the level of restriction and the strange sort of COVID camps almost that that they set up. I mean, the whole thing with, with aggressive uh, handling of protests, and I saw pictures of, of pepper spraying old ladies on the ground and things like that, and you're, I'm thinking certainly isn't going to be because of that government. It might be my own if I if I get super, super um, hamstrung in, in the United States, then then maybe I'd consider it for, for that reason, but but not to go play there for that government. There's there's just no way. I mean, um, I think it's probably a hill worth dying on. I really do. I really do think that that body autonomy and, and your own choice to to not have to inject yourself with something that you might not feel comfortable with. Um, I think is very important. I, I mean, I don't see why we're giving this one up quite so easily, uh, to be honest. So let me just kind of set the context a little bit for how much of a sacrifice it is that you've made to stand on this principle. A lot of times we think about tennis or, you know, stars in, in sports, and we think of people like Djokovic or Nadal or Federer or the top stars in other sports who make tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars are set financially for life, but that's not the case for the vast majority of successful athletes who, unlike other people who develop a skill and can rely on that skill to earn a livelihood for their entire life, you have a finite amount of time for as long as your body lasts. You struggled with a lot of injuries early in your career, so you really only arrived in the top 100 
uh, kind of mid-career, when you were in your, already in your, your mid to late 20s, you're now 30 years old. Hopefully you have a lot of years left, but we certainly don't know how many more years. And it's not just Australia. It may be that you end up having to sacrifice other tournaments in the future as well with country, in countries that have similar mandates. I understand the values that you're invoking, the importance of them, bodily autonomy, individual choice, not submitting to the dictates of governments over which you have no democratic control. But why is why are these principles to you worth risking so much of your future financial stability and even of the career that you've worked your entire life in order to have? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, going back to my the early years of my career, uh, where you're playing futures events and challengers events, which are the double A and triple A um, uh, of tennis, where you're not making much money at all, you're not playing in front of any fans, and I stuck it out because I thought it was the thing that I, that I should do. I thought it was the journey that I should go on. You know, people talk about going on their journey, you know, but it, it is true. You, you go on a, a journey and you don't know where you're going to go and where you're going to head, but it certainly wasn't the thing that I was playing for was money. It certainly wasn't the case that I was playing for fame or for money or for some sort of outside approval. I was playing for my own approval. I was playing um, to see, you know, where it would take me, how good I could get. Um, could I compete with the best in the world? Um, those are the things that I, that I played for. I didn't play for, for money. And so I think as, as I've gotten older and yeah, it's become a lot more lucrative for me. And especially this time of the year, as you pointed out, I mean, it's the last three years, my, I've made my career basically in, in January and February and, uh, you know, south of the equator in, in Australia and, and in New Zealand, but it's still, sticks with me that I don't play tennis for money. I, I, I just don't. I mean, it's great and I'm grateful for it. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm not happy that I don't have to think about, uh, you know, paycheck to paycheck really at these futures events anymore. But still, like when it comes to a decision like this, it's like, okay, well, where are you going to look in 20 years time? Are you going to look back and be, you know, more upset with yourself that you let your career slip by because of your morals or you let your career slip by because of a of a decision that maybe was, you you didn't think through enough, or are you going to look back in 20 years time with how things are potentially going and the way that the state and the authoritarian state seems to be creeping up in, in Western countries all over the place with how they're implementing these mandates. And am I going to look back in 20 years time and think, man, I kind of buckled for a paycheck and kind of weighing those two against each other. I'm thinking, look, I don't want to look back. I'm okay looking back and thinking, man, I kind of let my career slip by and this blew over in two years time and it wasn't really a big deal and and everybody kind of relaxed. Um, I'm more comfortable with that than I am looking back and thinking, wow, the authoritarian state creeped up in the West and this was a big turning point. These two, three, four, five years, uh, these COVID years, they were a big deal. And I made the short-term cho- choice for uh, money, for, for monetary gain. And, and uh I haven't lost any sleep over it. And I think that's a big deal, honestly, is how do you sleep at night? Do you worry about it? Do you agonize over it? Do you think about it? Um, I haven't really agonized over it at all. I've, I've been super comfortable with it. I haven't, um, you know, I haven't agonized, like I said, and, and I have this plan for this year that I'm thinking maybe I can't leave the States at all. And it would be kind of cool if I, because I'm going to fall outside of a hundred for sure. Uh, losing Australian open points from, from 2020 that still haven't fallen off yet. And uh, last year, I didn't really have a great chance to defend. And this year, I have no chance to defend. And so I'm going to lose those. And I've got this plan of getting my ranking back inside of 100, not being able to leave the, the States and playing in the US Open uh, end of August. And uh, kind of just being this stuck in America tennis player that's still finding a way to, to make some ground and make some headway. And um, that inspires me and motivates me. There's still a, a goal. It's not the goal that I would like, which is compete in all the slams. Um, because I seem to play my best tennis there, but still I have something to, to hold on to from a career standpoint uh, for now. You know, it's interesting, I, as, you're, as you're giving me that answer, I you know remember being back in Hong Kong in 2013 when I first met Edward Snowden, and he was at the time a 29-year-old who had a lucrative paycheck and a successful career and a bright future. He wasn't, you know, a lot of times people who do whistleblowing or who sacrifice for a cause or kind of alienated from society anyway. A lot of times they're angry at their failures. They don't have a lot to give up. He was kind of the opposite model. And I remember asking him exactly, you know, a similar question, which was why at 29 years old, no matter how much do you believe in this abstract cause of privacy, are you willing to risk so much 
in defense of it, meaning potentially going to prison for the next 40 years, or he ended up actually quite lucky, which was eight years so far in counting with no end in sight, exiled in Russia. Why were you willing to endure that much in pursuit of this kind of abstract cause? And his answer to me was, you know, essentially, no matter what they do to me, it won't be as bad as having to live with the knowledge that I had the opportunity to take a stand in an important moment and I didn't have the courage of my convictions to do that. And I, I do think that, I mean, part of why I wanted to start with your own situation is because I think it's always worth highlighting whatever, you know, it's very easy to kind of wave a banner and say that you have a certain cause. It's a lot harder and a lot rarer to actually sacrifice your own self-interest in defense of it. I do want to though ask you, um, men's tennis, unlike a lot of other sports, I think it's been more vaccine hesitant than most other sports. My guess is because it's a very international sport. The number one tennis player, Novak Djokovic, is Serbian. The top 10 is filled with people from Russia and Germany and Spain and uh, Greece and lots of other different countries. That's always why tennis has been interesting to me. It's kind of brings together this clash of culture. <laughs> I remember reading in September or even in October, as late as that, that something like 40% of the top 100 players in the world were still unvaccinated. The ATP now says only 5% of the top 100 are unvaccinated. We know two of them. One is Novak Djokovic, the other is yourself, which means that a large number of tennis players didn't want to get the vaccine. And at the end of the day, they decided... Well, look, it's not really that big of a deal. At the end of the day, it's just getting a vaccine that the scientific establishment says is safe and effective. I can look around, see a bunch of people getting the vaccine. They seem to not be dropping dead and doing okay. I guess at the end of the day, it's not that big of a deal to just take this job and be able to get on with my career. Why is getting the vaccine something that's so important for you to retain the autonomy not to do? Well... I think if it was only two shots and then you're done <clears throat> and then you're done with this COVID-19 thing, which is kind of what we were told early on, even though I don't think that was uh, necessarily what was thought by the people telling us this at the time, but still that's what we were told was that, okay, you get two shots and then you're good. And then you can go on with your life and COVID's going to stop. And when you encounter the COVID-19 virus, it's going to end with you that part. And uh, as long as we all kind of, buckle down and hold hands. We're going to get through this together. And, and that's just not the case. And so it's, it's two shots and then it's one jab and then it's a fourth jab, depending on where you are and maybe even a fifth and hopefully the strains weaken. And then we're, we're, we're maybe over this, but, um, you're not signing up for just one go and that that's not the case. And so one, I don't think I'm no scientist and I don't have a lab coat. I'm wearing flannel. So like, <laughs> take everything I say with a grain of salt. But uh, I don't think the science is necessarily settled on what is the long-term effect of two shots and three, four booster shots. We don't necessarily know. We're getting information seemingly weekly on the potential risks. And I, I know a couple of days ago was the lengthening of women's potentially the lengthening of women's menstrual cycles that have been vaccinated and that has an effect. And so we don't really know what the effect is of that uh, particular um, side effect, but I, we, we don't know. We don't know, first of all. And and so then the, the other part is, okay, well, if you take this stance of, well, everyone's doing it and they'll leave me alone and I can just get, get this. And, and well, that's the, like when, when the authoritarian state is creeping up on your shoulder, it doesn't do it by hitting you over the head first. It slowly creeps up and it gives you little tiny incentives to buckle under the pressure that they're uh, invoking. Little tiny, okay, well, it's not so bad. Okay, well, this isn't so bad. And then all of a sudden you wind up in Siberia and you're like, well, <laughs> how did I get in Siberia? It's like, well, you kind of let it happen. It's, it's not necessarily your fault, but you kind of let it happen over time. It was a slow creep. And this, I mean, realistically, this hasn't been that slow of a creep. This is something that's all been kind of thrown in and thrown at us in the span of a year and a few months and not particularly well prepared. It's been rushed out and hashed out and thrown at us seemingly. And the science changes every couple of weeks on what is, you know, what's the best and most optimal thing to do. But I think it's that concept and that idea of, if you don't stop it when it first starts initially creeping up on you, then you're going to be more and more willing to just continue on the slide because you've already invested 
so much of your person into this sort of idea. You've already buckled a little bit. So then you think, well, I've already gone down this path. I'm going to keep going down this path. But if you start early and go down the path of, hey, I'm not going to buckle. I'm going to stand on my first principles here and now early. Um, I think that even a small percentage of people can kind of turn the tide, even if a large percentage go along with it, because either they feel like they have to. I mean, I'm in a blessed and, and, and lucky position that I, I'm not living paycheck to paycheck, but there are people that are, relatively speaking, and if they don't get vaccinated, they lose their jobs. It's okay. Well, <laughs> what kind of decision is that? That's not a decision. You're basically being forced. At, you're being forced at that point. But I'm not in the case, not in the place where I'm being forced. And I'm not living paycheck to paycheck. And there's other careers to have. It, may, it might not be as lucrative or fun or glamorous as professional tennis, but there's still things to do in life. And it's not the end all, the all. Yeah, you know, I, I think the first time I really felt the resentment in a visceral way was when it came time to decide whether we were going to have our children vaccinated. And there's a lot of different calculus that go into that. How old is your child? What is their health condition? What do you think is the risk of the vaccine for children versus the benefit of that vaccine? And we started having a debate about, do we want to have them double vaccine? Do we want to have them just get the first dose and not the second? Do we want to have them not get a dose at all? And we kind of got to the point where we realized on some level, we don't actually really have a choice. If we want them to continue to go to the school that they're in, if we want to travel with them, if we want to just have them be able to access all the different, you know, arenas of life that as a kid, you should be having full access to, the state has basically forced you into getting them vaccinated without allowing you as a parent to go through the decision-making process about what's best for them or not. And that's when you really feel in a visceral way that this is not just abstract, that this is really the deprivation of, of what ought to be your basic liberty to make the most basic choices about your family, about yourself, about your body. The argument, obviously, that people make to those of people like you who have decided not to get the vaccine or who believe in your right not to is that ordinarily a person has the right to make a decision for themselves that affects themselves as long as it's not hurting other people. No state or other entity should interfere in that right. But in the case of vaccines, if you are unvaccinated, your chances of contracting the virus are higher. Your chances, therefore, of transmitting it to other people and infecting other people are higher. And therefore, your decision to be unvaccinated is not just one that you're making for yourself, but you're also subjecting other people to heightened risk. And that's the reason the state has a legitimate interest in coercing or encouraging or even forcing you to take it. What is your view of that argument? So I think the language is very important here. The language is very, very important. And the language that's being used is that if you're vaccinated and you have you get sick, or you, first if you get COVID and then if you get sick, it's a breakthrough case. It's a breakthrough. And, and I have a problem with this language because if you look around in heavily vaccinated countries like Israel, like Austria and Germany um, and Denmark, you have, these are the nine, like 90 percentile of the population is vaccinated. And yet cases are rising and they've had daily cases rise to the point of uh, breaking year highs. It's like the highest recorded day of COVID in a year has been with the most vaccinated um, Right. Even population. more so than when before there was a vaccine. Right. Right. And so that's one, because of Omicron, uh, two, what, waning, waning effectiveness potentially. But Okay, so we're talking about transmissibility in cases. We're not talking about hospitalizations or death, but transmissibility in cases. I'm not seeing where it's oh so crystal clear that the science is in that if you get vaccinated, you're just you're much less likely to get it. You're much less uh, likely to give it to somebody else. Where is that? Where is that coming from exactly? Where is that coming from? Yeah, you're you're less likely given your other factors in play, your different co comorbidities, uh, comorbidity. Sorry. Uh, uh, whether or not you're obese and things like that, um, of being going to the hospital or dying from COVID, fair right, enough. Right, that's your own choice. That, that's but, your own. But your but the community good, the idea that you're right. doing the community good. If I'm an athlete, for example, how and what in what way am I doing the community good by getting vaccinated or not? I just I just don't see it, and I don't see the argument, and it's not the argument being made. The argument is being made of well, this is just the case, but. Show me why it's the case. If it was the case, it would be pretty easy to prove. You could easily show me the statistics of country that have countries that have high vaccination rates and their case numbers are crazy low. That would be the case, right? 
but that's not. And so I know that go, there's other factors at play there, like the amount of testing, um, you know, things like that. Maybe there's more testing available now than there was a year ago, although it, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. A year ago, we still had a lot of testing, but um, I just I just don't see that as being the community good. I think there are other things that could be the community good that could help your transmissibility and the likelihood that you get COVID, like exercise, like sleep, like vitamin C, vitamin D, um, you know, what, what is what exactly are you putting in your body? Alcohol consumption, something that's going to hurt your immune system and cause your immune system to not fight COVID as well. So maybe you maybe you don't even get COVID when you encounter it unless you're out and about, you know, 10 drinks in at a bar. Like that's all of a sudden, if you get vaccinated, you can make terrible health decisions and you're seen as being morally good. I don't understand how that's even possible. Like morally good for making a bunch of other decisions, but you make one right one. Uh, I've, I've seen Joe Rogan make this argument. Like, okay, yeah, no, he, 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 hundreds, he was making the argument. I've made hundreds making and argument hundreds. That there, were, there were people who were obese, people who have never paid attention to their diet or their exercise regimen, whereas he has devoted his life to being extremely healthy, speaking about him as though he's reckless about his own health and that they're mm. in a position of moral superiority. And I think the point you're making is that there seems to be this one specific choice about our health, which is taking the vaccine or not, that is venerated in every other factor that determines whether you're healthy, both against COVID or whether you're a burden on the healthcare system in general, for some reason is completely ignored. It's kind of like the when you were making the example earlier about um, making a decision for a cause or something you believe in that actually hurts you, that hurts you financially. <clears throat> uh, it's, it kind of reminded me of this social media idea where if you have the right opinions or the right ideas, then you're seen as morally good. You can make the moral superior position without really risking anything. <coughs> and it's kind of similar in this way where you make this one decision and you can take the moral high ground over somebody who's making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of correct decisions for their body and their health. But you make this one decision and you have the moral superiority over somebody who's making hundreds of thousands of decisions for their own health. And it's like this weird sort of continuation of this fake morality that just it's not real. It's not based in, it's not based in reality even a little bit. And so that, like that seeing like these discrepancies, um, maybe cause I just have like a contrarian personality by nature, but it makes me want to get vaccinated much less, like whatever convincing argument you could make to me, these aren't it. These are the opposite of that. This like pushes me away. Like, okay, why are you forcing this upon me so heavily? If we can't have a discussion about this and you can't convince me that I'm doing the community good, that I'm, that I'm, doing my own body good, that I'm helping myself and the community. This is the right decision. Um, if you can't convince me of these things and you just, whatever, you you restrict me, you tell me that I can't do certain things and you say that you have the moral high ground on a health perspective, then I, uh, it's the opposite of convincing me. I think that you have some sort of nefarious idea about you um, just by nature. So you referenced earlier the kind of draconian lockdown and other repressive conditions that have prevailed in Australia over the last two years, which I think is a big part, obviously, of the controversy surrounding Djokovic, the idea that a lot of Australians are saying, look, we submitted willingly, in a really creepy way, actually, to extreme deprivations of our liberty over the last two years as Australians in the name of fighting COVID. And now this foreigner gets to just kind of waltz in, violate all the rules, and because he's rich, because he's famous, because he's important to the tennis community, we're supposed to just swallow that. And I want to just ask your own personal experience, describe what that was like in 2020. When you did go to Australia, you went to go and play in, turn in the tournament and like dozens of other professional athletes, you were quarantined in this 14 day hard lockdown in a hotel, which maybe doesn't sound like it's all that difficult to people who haven't done it, oh, 14 days in a hotel, but describe what that was actually like and, and how that experience was for you. Well, it was wild because I, I tested positive for COVID in November of 2020, end of November. <clears throat> and uh, my first test that I took was in January, uh, a couple of days before I was flying from Orlando to LA to get on the charter flight from LA to Melbourne. And so when I'm, I was two days later, I get the result while I'm on the flight from Orlando to LA and I see that my results positive and I'm like gosh you got to be kidding me because I know this is going to be an absolute hassle now because I know it's not a real positive because one I had it a month and a half prior just about and I've been training really hard 
not sick at all, no symptoms. I don't have long COVID because I have no symptoms since I got over COVID initially, the, the 10 day period or whatever. And so I'm thinking I'm in a lot of trouble here. And so there's a little portal where online where I can f- put both my tests in so that Tennis Australia gets the information. And then Tennis Australia can go through the Victorian government that goes to the federal government that goes to the Qatar Airways. And so that the lady that's working the desk at LAX can LAX can finally see that I'm able to board the flight. And I'm like, this process is way too long. I'm already thinking about it. There's no way that no anybody's going to help me in time that I can board this flight that you know leaves in two hours. And so... I try to check in and explain my situation and show my two tests. And she's like, you need a negative test and that's it. I'm like, yep, I'm screwed. And so I kind of start live tweeting the fact that I'm screwed uh, and not going to be able to board the flight. And I'm trying to, I'm talking to the ATP and people are trying to help me. And finally, like on the the 12th hour, it's um, the flight's leaving at 430 and they check my bag at 420 at the desk. And I'm finally getting on the flight and I'm, live tweeting that too. I'm like, oh, they're letting me on. Like, this is fantastic. So finally, somebody got through to, to Tennis Australia and they, da, 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 all the steps were taking place. And I got on the plane and about an hour, two hours into the flight, <clears throat> I'm starting to notice that I'm getting a lot of hate that I'm on this plane. A lot of hate, like way more hate than I realized. I thought it was kind of like you mean, a you funny- mean from the internet or from the people on the plane? From the people on the internet, from 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 Twitter, not from the people on the plane. Right. The people on the plane right. were, were cool because there was- there was even this understanding and knowledge at this point that, hey, if you had COVID, you're like, at least for three months, the thought was you're fairly protected, like you're really protected. And there wasn't a vaccine yet. So we didn't know how that would relate to getting the vaccine. But there was this thinking that, hey, you're you're very, 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 very protected and very unlikely to get the uh, get COVID again in that time frame. So everybody that I was around was like, really happy that I got on the flight. But the internet was not happy that I got on the flight. And so I'm getting a lot of hate from Australians that are thinking that I'm some virus spreading vector that's going to come and infect their whole country while they're on lockdown. And I'm like on the wing of the plane and I like boarded in secret. And it's this weird sort of conspiracy. And I'm like, I can't. How how are we here? How is this happening? Like, how is this happening? Something that I thought was like this interesting sort of um, good part of Twitter where you can sort of like do like one of these kind of live threads. And people can read it and it's kind of like you're there real time no matter when you're reading it i thought it would be kind of this interesting thing and it was not this interesting thing glenn it was not interesting at all it was it was quite bad and so when i get there i mean my phone's blowing up and news organizations want to talk to me and all these things like am i some sort of health risk I'm like i'm like the least the only person who's less of a health risk is another american player that was that uh, had covid like the middle of december he was the most protected guy and his his uh, first test was negative so he was fine but like he's the only guy in the country that's more protected than 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 i am because you had, had just gotten over covid and cleared it like right he he COVID had a he had an extra he had like a month buffer of more right. antibodies than i had and right. so and so i'm getting requests to like jump on these different media calls and and go on a television program. And then while this is going on, uh, these flights had uh, like one positive uh, test on each on upon arrival, which meant that, well, it didn't mean this beforehand, it, but it meant after that all these people on these planes had to hard quarantine for what turned out to be 15 days for some. So, so basically this rule emerged on your, on your way to Australia from Tennis Australia, that anyone, not just anyone who tested positive, but anyone who was on a plane with somebody who had tested positive had to go into hard quarantine, meaning, what does that mean, hard quarantine? Hard quarantine is you can't leave your hotel room for, for you, the You for just the whole phys- time. You physically, you physically are can't leave. in your hotel room for 14 days. You cannot, yes. Not that you can't leave your hotel. You can't no. leave your hotel room. No, no, no. Which apparently it's very healthy to not go outside and get sunlight. Apparently it's very healthy to stay in your room and breathe your own air for, for 15 days and not see any sun because that's that's following the science plan. Is if you get no vitamin D for 15 days, you're going to be healthier than if you uh, were able to go outside in some form or fashion. Uh, but that wasn't the case. They they were very misleading because they the way that they worded it was that they were separating these planes and they only had them at like twenty five percent capacity so that if somebody tested positive at the front of the plane it would be up to the health ministry to decide who was a close contact but it wasn't automatic that everybody on the plane would be a close contact because if they said that nobody would have gone nobody would have gone and so it turned out that they separated these planes so that if there was a positive case. 350 players wouldn't have to hard quarantine from one plane. It was only like 75 players per plane. 
So three planes, we would have lost, if there was three planes and we had them full, we would have lost the whole draw. Everybody would have been two weeks hard quarantine and nobody would have wanted to go if they said this up front. So this kind of started this whole like very much distrust. And, and this is how the most of the players feel is the fact that Tennis Australia lied to us and or at least they 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 befuddled the truth so that we weren't really sure what the case was. And so then they could fall back on, well, the health ministry decided it wasn't us. It was the health ministry. That's what all these uh, tournaments and events have done is whenever there's a controversial decision, they say, well, it's not up to us. It's the health ministry. And so we really have very little dis- uh, you know, way to to fight back in, in when it comes down to the government deciding to do what they will to us. But 15 days, hard quarantine, a lot of negative press. Um, I, I got I did a little video at the fact that we had to do 15 days. So when we arrived, it was like 6 a.m. And so... I thought that we everybody assumed we'd get out 6 a.m. 14 full days later, but no, they decided to wait till midnight on the on the 14th day. So we had an extra we had an extra like 15 hours in our room. For some reason, they decided to let us out at midnight, which made no sense to me. I'm like, where's the science in that? Like, where's the science of like the extra 14 hours? And so I actually went to the courts at 1 a.m. to go hit balls for the first time under the lights um, with with Vashek Pospisil uh, because. I thought, well, at least hitting once would be better than hitting not at all. And I need to start hitting balls. And what was funny is one of the, the guy that was, uh, if you if you actually were the guy that had the positive uh, test upon arrival, you were 10 days in your room and you were free. But if you were a, a close contact, you had 15 days in your room to wait it out because you might get COVID on the 15th day. I thought that's that also is the science. That's great. That's great. The science is yeah, very so that interesting. Obviously, that obviously created you know on your part a lot of frustration a lot of skepticism a lot of distrust and animosity toward tennis australian with all of these protocols and with all of these rules um but seeing the response seeing the response from the australian people uh not everybody obviously i'm I'm using a broad brush by saying australian people Mm -hmm. but there was a lot of people that were saying that i was some vector of the virus and i was going to get everybody sick and there was a lot of frustration that there were tennis players there that that we were even there into the country, and because there were there are Australian nationals scattered across the globe that can't get back because there are no flights and the, the restrictions are so tough, and they're not able to get back. And so there was this idea that these tennis players are are privileged and stuck up and just going to get paid coming into our country when we've had to endure all these lockdowns. And there's this idea of well, if we've had to endure this, then they should have to endure equal to awful rules, like whatever awful rules we've had to endure, they should endure the same because we've had to. And my idea and plea to people who think that way is that if you are upset at the rules, be upset at the people who have made the rules. Don't be upset at us for coming and trying to be entertainment. We're not here to do anything other than play tennis. Don't be upset at us. Be upset at the people who have made these awful shitty rules and don't follow them anymore. That's what I would say. Yeah, so that's the perfect segue to the talking about the Djokovic situation itself. I think that conflict you just laid out is exactly what has driven all of it. So just for those who don't know the timeline, Novak Djokovic is unvaccinated. He's long expressed skepticism about vaccines. He contracted uh, the virus in mid-2020 when he set up a tournament in Serbia. He and several other players who participate did. He cleared it rather quickly. The question always was, he's somebody who's won the tournament nine times. Um, It's kind of a historic, uh, potentially historic effort on his part to go and play in Australia. Not only is he trying to win it his 10th time, but he's currently tied for the most Grand Slams ever in the history of men's tennis with Federer and Nadal at 20. He would break the record if he won and win his 21st Grand Slam. So it's an enormous deal in the tennis world and the sports world for him to go and try and play. And the problem has always been people have suspected he's unvaccinated because he refused to say whether he was, which was his right. Now we know he is. And so Tennis Australia and the rules of the tournament were either you have to show proof of vaccination or you have to qualify for an exemption. He qualified for an exemption. There was no uh, announcement about the grounds for that exemption. So people were very skeptical about how it was that the world's most fit player or one of the world's most fit players had a medical condition that prevented them from getting the vaccine. As it turned out, the exemption that they cited was on the basis of the fact that he had just been infected again for the second time in mid-December, and therefore the vaccine was unnecessary because of the immunity that you get from having cleared the virus from your system. 
So they announced his exemption. He got on the plane being told, having been told that he was welcome to the country, that he was exempt under the rules. A huge political firestorm erupted in Australia, the exact kind of resentment that you just described. We've been locked down for two years. We were all forced to get the vaccine. We haven't even been able to cross state lines for much of the last two years. Extreme levels of, of repression. And now he gets to just come in and violate all the rules because he's Novak Djokovic. And in response to that political controversy, the prime minister essentially said, we're going to deny him the visa at the border. They did deny him the visa at the border when he got there. They detained him for 12 hours, eventually told him that they were canceling his visa. He was taken to a detention hotel, which is where people go when they try and get into Australia, but are deemed to be there illegally until a judge in a really resounding live hearing that I know you watched and so did I very emphatically said that he was treated unfairly. He reversed that decision. Djokovic was able to enter Australia. He's been practicing at, at the Australia, Australian Open. But there's still the question of whether the health minister or the home secretary who has the power to revoke anyone's visa is now going to revoke his visa anyway and deport him from the country. What's your assessment generally about the situation with Djokovic and his attempt to stay in Australia? Well, you, you, you overviewed it fantastically. I would say that the just about the medical panels that reviewed these sort of the cases for these medical exemptions is that there were two panels with name anonymity. So then there was no names attached to them. And this was the idea of if you cleared this, these two panels, then you were granted your medical exemption. You're granted your visa from the Victorian government and you were good to go. So he had these papers. He's good to go. He wouldn't have gone unless he had this approval and these papers in hand because they wouldn't have let him on the plane and there's no way he's going to get in the country. There's almost this idea of he was in like the, the luggage hold trying to sneak his way into Australia and that, or there's this weird misconception that either a, he didn't fill out the right visa form, which was the story that was promulgating only because the Australian government had these just awful interrogation tactics to try to get him to sign this paper that canceled his visa saying that it would be the best case scenario and pushing him to do it before anybody was even awake yet after on like his eighth hour of being detained they they manipulated him to cancel his his visa because they didn't they didn't allow him to wait till anybody was awake yet it was 6 30 in the morning they can't contact anybody and so his lawyers tennis australia no help um so it's just such a weird strange political politically driven uh story and narrative and almost like a witch hunt against, I hate to use witch hunt because witch hunt has this, has this uh, very uh, Trumpian feel to it, but it's this witch hunt of like this guy who wouldn't be there unless he had this medical exemption granted by this country. And now the other faction of this country that is very uh, pro lockdown and trying to make its case, its damnedest case that it's not going to have any double standards um, which apparently 2022 is an election year. And so election years always bring these sorts of things to a head because people are always trying to make their final stamp and stand to say, hey, this is the hot button topic that we pushed for. And we showed you that we stuck it to Novak Djokovic, which I don't even understand how that's a good point. Like, hey, we've been screwing you for two years, but don't worry, we screwed this guy too. It's like, okay, great. Good job, guy. Um but the prime minister made comments uh, in, re in regards to Djokovic, how we're going to recheck his papers when he gets here. And if it, everything doesn't clear, it's like everything did clear, dude. It's all cleared. He wouldn't be here if it wasn't all cleared. And you've already let people into the country with the same exemptions. Um, it's wild, absolutely wild. And then when they finally, you know, obviously they, they revoked his visa and detained him and all these things. And then lo and behold, I, I was just talking with somebody about it before they did it, was that are they going to start retroactively going after people who have already been cleared? And then sure enough, they did it to a, a, a WTA player who had already been in the country for eight days, had played her first WTA warm-up event before the Australian Open, and then they detain her. They detained her. She'd already been and this through. Is, this is like a, this is a 28-year-old double specialist who barely scrapes out a living on the tour. She had entered on the same exemption that she had just been infected, and therefore the vaccine was unnecessary. And because of that political pressure, they went and hunted her down and deported her. And she's now back in her home country. Unbelievable. It's, it's an unbelievable story. And you, you, how can you think that how they're behaving is anything but authoritarian? It, it's, it boggles my mind. It boggles my mind. And, and so to treat these players who are coming to play tennis, who had previously granted these exemptions and these visas to come into the country and to say that, oh, well, they need to follow the rules. They are following the rules. You're changing the rules on them mid-go because of politics. 
because politics has infected these decisions, these decisions. And so to see the judge, and when, when, when you have the prime minister playing politics, it's very nice to, to have watched that hearing and to see the judge not playing politics, to be looking at the straightforward, or at least what I think is straightforward, and it might be my biased opinion, but it looked very straightforward to me. Like, what more do you, would you have wanted this man to do to follow the rules that have been set out for him? What more would he, could he have done? And so that, that was the basis, I think, of his, his kind of deliberation and his argument. Uh, the judge was, I just don't understand what else he could have done. So here, go play. Go, go get him, buddy. So, so tell us, one of the, the conflicts here that I think is really interesting, I'm interested in how, how you look at it, is unlike, say, the NFL or Major League Baseball or the NBA, which plays almost entirely in the United States, maybe a little bit in Canada, it's not an international sport. Tennis is a sport that you, you travel all over the world. You play in essentially every part of the world. You're constantly traveling, which means that you're always entering foreign countries. And these countries that host tournaments, on the one hand, have an obligation to be hospitable to the players coming in from all over the world to make sure that you're able to enter the country, that you're treated well while you're there. But on the other hand, you kind of as tennis players have an obligation to somewhat adapt to the norms of that country or the culture of that country. Just because you're tennis players doesn't entitle you to just barge into other countries and, and act however you want. And I think what struck me, what called my attention earlier was when you were explaining your own decision about why you weren't willing to submit to Australia's vaccine mandate. And it would, you appeal to a little bit of a nationalist sentiment by saying, look, it'd be one thing if my government forces me to do it. I still wouldn't want that. I would still resist it, but at least I'd be, I could swallow that a little bit more if it's my own government over whom I have some democratic say, rather than some other foreign government on the other side of the world telling me what I have to put into my body. So I think if you look at it from the perspective of Australian citizens, they're looking at it in that same way through that same nationalistic lens, though with a kind of different uh, outcome, which is, you know what? In, in Australia, as repressive as these these lockdowns seem to you and to me, they've been largely popular in Australia. As you said, the reaction of Australia is, is very much, we did the right thing when it came to COVID. And their attitude seems to be that if you want to come into our country in order to play in this tournament, and yes, you're entertainers, but you're also coming to make a lot of money, you end up getting a lot of benefits from coming to Australia, we in Australia want you to be vaccinated. And if you don't want to be vaccinated, that's fine. And you just don't have to come into our country. What, I mean, what, what about that sentiment that clearly is at play here? It's not just the government itself. The reason the government is doing it is because they know that this is the majoritarian sentiment in Australia, very much behind this idea that Djokovic is somebody who ought to be punished. No one thinks he's a health risk, right? He just got a positive test. He's incredibly fit. The idea is I think they want to see him punished because he hasn't submitted to the orders and have, hasn't been this kind of acquiescent citizen the way so many people in Australia have. But is there any validity to their nationalism that says, if you want to come into our country, you have to obey our rules and our rules are you have to be vaccinated? Well, uh, about my comments earlier, I think that my, my, my larger point was the fact that not just from a nationalistic standpoint, but the fact that that Australia has been more objectively more authoritarian than the United States in enforcing these mandates and enforcing lockdowns and enforcing vaccination. And so I think that is the more important thread for me is that if my if America had been in that similar way, I think I'd be more than comfortable not submitting to that and just taking whatever lump they're going to throw at me. Um, I'm almost of the of the mind that if the more free you make the choice, the more likely I would be to make the choice. And so the more authoritarian you are, the more, the less likely I am to make this sort of choice to get, to get vaccinated. And so that was kind of my idea was not only is Australia, not my country, but it's also more authoritarian, which is the reason why I don't want to get vaccinated in the first place. And so they kind of fit this, this double, this double whammy where I'm like, no, there's no way, there's just no way. And so I understand the idea from them, which is what you laid out. It's, you know, this is what we've had to go through. This has been popular for us and it's, it's helped us. We look at death numbers and it's helped us. And I would say that last year, this was a good argument that the cases are extremely low. We're going for no cases. We don't want anybody to come into the country that could have cases and infect other people that are for the most part, not at risk. And anytime they had five to 10 cases anywhere, they shut down entire regions. And it's like, okay, well, if you guys are going to do this, I'm okay. I'll do the two-week lockdown, even though it makes no real scientific sense for me to do so. I'll do it and I'll shut my mouth. And I did. I didn't say a word about it because it's like, okay, you guys have taken this 
this sort of approach to COVID and you've sacrificed a lot for your approach. So, okay, I'll participate. That makes sense. But now, now it doesn't make any sense. They've had more cases since Christmas. This was, this was a week ago. They've had more cases since Christmas a week ago than they've had the entire pandemic. The cases are going up 30, 40,000 a day. Okay. What health risk is Novak Djokovic at this point? You know, you can't make the argument that now we need to conform to these even older draconian rules that really don't make sense anymore as you've opened up society and increased vaccination rates, which is great. Your vaccination rates are crazy high, but your cases are rising pretty high, pretty fast. What risk are these tennis players coming into your country that are predominantly vaccinated? Or even if they weren't vaccinated, they're still not particular health risks and good vectors for spreading COVID. So what is the real reason behind it? And you said it, it's, we want you to submit to our rules. And it's like this weird sort of it's like this pleasurable act to make somebody like Novak submit. We want to see you submit to these rules. And in particular, because you don't want to. Either you're going to get hit financially, you're going to get hit from a, a career standpoint, and you're going to watch at home Rafael Nadal win the, the Australian Open and surpass and take the lead in Grand Slams, or you're going to submit and we're going to inject you with something. It's like Okay, well, you're. Are you getting off to this? Is this? Does this like? Does this satisfy you to make this man go through this? Because it doesn't make any sense, and it does, certainly doesn't make sense from a scientific standpoint. As cases are rising, as transmissibility is clearly working just fine, whether or not you're vaccinated or not, uh, in Australia, I, I don't. I don't see what the reason that we should be afraid of Novak, in particular. It's like just let him go. Just let him go and be free. So my last question, have is, um, in addition to yourself, there are two probably of the high, two, the two highest profile women's players who are also absent from Australia. One is Serena Williams. I don't know whether she's vaccinated. I haven't seen any public indication of whether she is. She said the reason she hasn't gone, uh, that she didn't go, even though she's won, I think, six times, is because she just physically wasn't ready, which is possible. She's 40 years old. Um Although I don't know what the real reason is, if that is the real reason or if it has something to do with vaccination. Her sister, Venus Williams, whose ranking has fallen below what's necessary to qualify. She's nearing the end of her career. Obviously, she's 41. Uh, nonetheless, went on to Novak Djokovic's Instagram page after the court ruled in his favor and congratulated him and said, I'm rooting for you to win the entire tournament. Is... What is your sentiment with regard to Djokovic and the Australian Open? Are, do you share Venus's William, Venus Williams' hope that he wins the tournament? And if he isn't permitted to play because he's deported, will you be watching the tournament? Uh, first about, about Venus. I love Venus. And uh, I was seeing some reaction to her comment about Novak and this weird sort of like uh, she's supported vaccines in the past. Why is she making this comment about Novak who's unvaccinated? And it's this weird idea of trying to treat unvaccinated people like the other like this other group that should be demonized at all costs. And if you support them in any way, then you're supporting death from COVID. It's like this, again, this moral hypocrisy is just so rampant in these sorts of discussions that you can't even parse out like, I support you in your fight to go play tennis and not be detained. Well, you're clearly anti-vax and that you want people to die from COVID. It's like, how do you make these jumps? They're making these jumps just, they freak me out. And they, I, I get worried for the, the collective IQ sometimes. But um, I have a lot of support for Novak. Uh, I, I personally uh, find him to be a great inspiration uh, for not just from a tennis perspective, but how he carries himself and, and watching him fight through the things that he fights through and, and how he goes about his training and how meticulous he is and the work ethic he puts into it. Um, so... I, I want to see him win. I want to see him play. I want to see him compete. I want to see him win. I want to see the drama because I know there's going to be a lot of drama. Um, and we love that. At the end of the day, we love that. We love that about sports. We, this story is much bigger than sports. But when it when it's going to, if it does end up hopefully getting sort of put down into that lens of just pure sport and we get to watch all these things unfold as you're trying to do something as difficult and, and mechanically intensive and physically demanding as tennis, um, it's going to be something to behold, really. It really is going to be entertaining. And, and if he's able to make a run, um, which I think he will, barring the fact that his game is intact and his physical conditioning is intact, um, his spirit and his fight will be intact and his focus will be. And it's going to be really something to watch. Uh, I'm highly looking forward to it. If he's not playing and he gets deported uh, after a judge grants him 
uh, this 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 visa and the medical exemption is all clear and he's good to go. If the, if they actually do deport him, it's clearly political. Um, clearly, the authoritarian state in Australia is just too overwhelming. Uh, at that point, I really don't think that they should be hosting a Grand Slam because it's hard enough for international tennis players to get into one country during COVID, let alone a country that's acting in this fashion. Uh, and I will not be watching the Australian Open at all if that is the case because I don't want to support such an event. I really don't. Um, so it'll be interesting. All right, Tennis Wall. I know there's going to be a lot of people who don't necessarily agree with your the, the choice that you've chosen to make, but one thing I hope people can appreciate is that there's a big difference between staking out a position and following the, up that position with action that is to your detriment, to your material detriment, to your financial detriment, to your career detriment. It becomes, for me at least, an inherently noble act, whether I agree with the choice or not. So I wanted to draw attention to what it is that, that you personally have done, and I knew you'd have some helpful insights into the Djokovic situation and the whole question of vaccine mandates as it affects sports and, and society, and, and I think you did. So I'm really appreciative of, of your taking the time to talk to me. Thank you, Glenn. Always a pleasure. I appreciate it. Yeah. Happy to talk to you. Bye-bye. Thanks.